Harry P. Dodge was born in Washington, D.C. in 1919. His father was a draftsman for the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And so Harry's fascination with railways began in childhood. In 1958, Harry traveled to Europe. From then on, his real passion became the recording of railways, steam, and trams in every country he could visit. An able and accomplished cameraman, driven by a deep passion for his subject, Harry P. Dodge has left a unique and incredible record of the great railways of the world. We begin our journey behind what was the Iron Curtain in Poznan, Poland. Here in the mid-1960s, draconian restrictions for railway photography meant that most attempts were rewarded with arrest and sometimes even imprisonment. Somehow, Harry Dodge managed to bypass these restraints and has left us with a unique record of the Polskie Koleje Panstwowie, the Polish State Railways, as they were called more than 25 years ago. The PKP was a railway of decapods, that's five driving axle engines, mostly of German design. But the class TY246 here on the Poznan turntable is American. 100 of these 210s were delivered from 1946 onwards. And although their range of operations was limited by the 20-ton axle load, they became the most powerful locomotive in Poland. Poland's railway network took shape in the 19th century, while the country was still divided between Germany, Russia, and Austria. As a result, the PKP evolved from an amalgamation of the disparate railways of her former occupiers. Bydgoszcz is a typical Polish railway town, where little seems to have changed since the end of the war. Even today, trams still thrive in Poland, and steam locomotives have not yet been abandoned. Low wages and cheap coal combine to extend the life of the steam locomotive so that in the 1990s, Poland is the last stronghold of steam in Europe. The Polish locomotive numbering system is quite simple. The first letter signifies designation as a freight or passenger engine. An additional small letter K stands for tank. The next letter denotes the wheel arrangement, and this is followed by the year of design or order from the manufacturers. Each loco then has its own running number. At one time, 21 different letters of the alphabet were in use for differing axle arrangements. The locomotive shunting in the yards at Bydgoszcz is a TKT-3. Designed for freight, this tank engine has a 2A2 wheel arrangement and was built before the war. Poland still has scores of narrow gauge lines scattered throughout the country. Most are 750 mm gauge, but there are also some 600 and 785 mm lines, all of which were nationalized into the PKP in 1945. Polish narrow gauge locomotives were originally of German or Austrian origin, dating from the turn of the century or before. These were later supplemented by pre-war Polish engines, Russian stragglers, and even a few oddities from the Baltic states. Diesels introduced to the narrow gauge in the 1960s have now entirely replaced steam on these lines.
Further south in Wroclaw, the trams filed past a splendid example of Poland's abundant religious architecture, while in the station, a passenger train slowly pulls away from the platform. After the war ended in 1945, the regeneration of the railways was given high priority. Many new Polish locomotive designs were introduced, among them the class OL49 passenger locomotive. Intended mainly as a replacement for the aging German P8s, 116 of these 262s were designed and built by Kranow between 1949 and the early 1950s. These locomotives were the first to be equipped with the unique high-level smoke deflectors, which are typical of the PKP. The OL49 was a powerful and greatly valued engine. Although designed for mainline passenger work, it was also pressed into service for mixed traffic. Shortly before Harry Dodge's visit, some of the OL49s were still kept in store and each used in turn so that all the locomotives would have equal wear. On suburban trains, a much older 262 tank engine was still in regular use. Here at Wroclaw, an OKL 27, first introduced in 1928, pulls a modern double-deck passenger train. The TY45 was the first post-war Polish locomotive. 448 of these light 210s were built to help Poland's devastated economy back to life. Although Polish steam still survives, the rise of the diesel had already begun at the time of Harry's visit, and the massive decapods, which once gave the PKP such a German atmosphere, are due to be phased out with the rest of the remaining steam fleet in the mid-1990s. The most striking reminder of Poland's German railway heritage is the Deutsche Reichsbahn Class 52 Kriegslok. This austerity 210 was developed in 1940 as a standard all-purpose wartime machine. The Poles obtained 1,300 of them in 1945 and simply reclassified them as TY2. Designed for about 10 years' service, these rugged engines have exceeded their expected lifespan by 40 years. Double-heading decapods was still a common sight in the 1960s, and between them, these TY-45s could provide enough power to pull the heaviest freight trains. The Poles were so impressed with this wheel arrangement that they continued to evolve new designs, and the TY-51 represented the final word in the history of the Polish steam locomotive. American influence was also present in the form of the TR-20, one of a batch of U.S. Army transportation engines sent as part of the Marshall Aid Plan in 1945. On an embankment high above Wroclaw, we find another TR-20 
pulling a long freight train. The narrow gauge track to the left of the main line is less heavily used. Further east in Katowice, Harry found the modern town centre scene enhanced by trams in surprisingly cheerful livery. While in the surrounding countryside, the two 10 O's were very much in evidence. Another type of Polish locomotive still in common use was the class TKT48. This enormous general purpose machine was the PKP's standard tank engine. 194 of these 2A2 tanks were built from 1948 onwards and proved so useful that they were assigned to passenger as well as freight trains. The Polish network is essentially an amalgamation of light railways or naval bars. Poor track and slow train speed has led many Western visitors to refer to them as trundlebarns. In many rural parts of Poland, horse-borne traffic is still the norm, and roads are still almost empty. Branch line closures are surprisingly rare in Poland, but many halts are now deserted, and the tracks overgrown. Here we wait for a TKT48, to take on water before pulling out again for a run down the line. Our final scene from Poland is of this class PT31-282 as she pulls past the signal box at Sucha. In the yards of the Romanian capital of Bucharest, Harry Dodge recorded a plethora of locomotives which have long since disappeared. The alliance between Germany and Romania lasted until the 1940s and strongly influenced the design of the CFR's motive power. For almost 50 years, the Romanians made wide use of well-proven German designs. This long freight train is pulled by an elderly 260, assisted by a Class 150 210, based on the Deutsche Reichsbahn Class 50. The ever-popular Prussian P8s, G8s and G10s were also built in large numbers under license in Romania. Austrian locomotives, too, were used in large numbers by the CFR, as well as those of Hungary, America, and finally, Russia, as Romania's borders underwent massive contortions following both world wars. This Romanian class 230 10-wheeler on passenger duty is actually a Prussian P-10, while on the other side of the yard, a class 150 goes about its duties.
one unique feature of CFR power was the practice of burning a mixture of coal and oil. And this resulted in the addition of an oil tank on top of the tender water tank, directly behind the coal bunker. A few years after Harry's visit, steam was disappearing rapidly from the CFR, as diesel and electric units were introduced in increasing numbers. But it was not just the Germanic decapods, but also the older pre-war Hungarian locomotives that were still in service during the last few years of Romanian steam. Also near Bucharest, but this time on Romanian narrow gauge, Harry Dodge found this 080 tank engine, number 764411, shunting in the yards. Like most of the country's narrow gauge lines, the engines were on the elderly side and had their origins in Germany, Austria, and even Russia. Romanian standard gauge, this time in Oradea, Harry filmed one of the delightful class 324 262s as she pulled a passenger train into the station. A class 50, 
010 shunted in the yards. Nearly a quarter of the Romanian steam power consisted of these Prussian G10s, more than 800 of which were ordered between 1921 and 1942. Having dropped its passengers, the class 324 then ran round its train before coupling up and setting out again for a run along the line. border with Hungary is the setting of our last glimpse of Romanian steam. Charging across this bleak Balkan farmland is the most famous of all Romanian locomotives, the imposing class 142. 79 of these 284s were built and they were exact duplicates of the Austrian 214 class from the 1930s. Romanian 142s were soon in the majority as only 13 Austrian versions ever saw the light of day. Budapest, the ancient capital of Hungary, sits astride the magnificent river Danube, and the bridges which span this mighty river are a superb setting for the city's many tram cars. In Budapest's main station, Harry recorded the scene as several locomotives prepare to depart. The Hungarian State Railways, or MAV, once ran compounds, mallets, streamlined tank engines, and experimental 464s. Hungary wound up on the losing side in both world wars. As a result, she was stripped of many of her locomotives, and in some instances, lost entire classes. By the 1960s, American and German war locomotives provided almost all the freight power. But the most renowned of the Magyar locomotives were the magnificent 424 class 480s. These dual service machines date from 1924, and after their debut, won major international awards for excellence. The 424s were as mechanically perfect, powerful and reliable as they were handsome. They were found all over the country and were used to haul almost everything. 365 of these locomotives were built, with some of the engines exported to Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Russia, and even China. 
Tank locomotives were also common on the MAV. This 280 tank was just one of many classes which once regularly plied the lines along the banks of the Danube. Pulling into the station is another tank engine, this time a class 275. It's a 242, along with other light tanks such as the class 375 and class 376, the 275s were assigned mainly to passenger trains. By way of contrast, here is another example of a hard-working class 424. Hundreds of standard U.S. Army 280s could still be found working here at the time of Harry Dodge's visit. Having seen wartime service in France, these simple locomotives were unwanted in post-war America, but more than 20 years later, they were still greatly appreciated by the Hungarians, and as Class 411, these consolidations became the MAV's principal freight mover. Before leaving Hungary, we are treated to a glimpse of an extremely rare locomotive, dating from the days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, prior to the First World War. Harry's next destination was Prague, the capital of what was then Czechoslovakia, and still is one of Europe's most beautiful cities. The class 475 mountain was considered to be one of the most advanced steam engines in Europe. 147 of these two-cylinder superheated 482s were built by Škoda between 1947 and 1950. 25 more followed in 1951, with most of the second batch going to North Korea. Many of the features of this advanced locomotive were influenced by the great French designer André Chaplon. The class 475 replaced the heavier class 498 mountains as Czechoslovakia's standard mixed traffic loco. But even when double heading, it was light enough to run many of the secondary routes as well. Czechoslovakian motive power was once renowned for mechanical excellence and very high standards of cleanliness. Back in the 1960s, the CSD was still running plenty of steam, but diesel and electric power were spreading rapidly. Some locomotives, such as the 464 class, 484 tanks, which still worked branch line passenger services, were not far away from retirement. Here, a modern electric 
pulls a passenger train into a wet and smoky station in order to exchange its carriages with a class 475 mount. Steam freights were also handled by the 475s, but XDR class 52s, as well as Skoda built 210s, were used for the heaviest traffic. After the dismemberment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, most Czech locos were of Austrian or Hungarian design. Later, Czech railways' own designs resulted in some of the heaviest and most powerful locomotives anywhere in Europe. The final and heaviest of the express classes was the Mountain Class 498. These three-cylinder locomotives were built by Škoda between 1946 and 1955 and weighed almost 19 tons. The big red stars, sported by all CSD locomotives, were removed during the Prague Spring in 1967. In the eastern part of Czechoslovakia, now Slovakia, stand the Tatra Mountains. Since Harry Dodge's visit, steam has disappeared from the narrow 760mm gauge lines of these remote and deeply wooded hills, with diesel-powered Duzeg rail cars taking its place. The lines are not busy, and the overgrown stations are often reminiscent of parts of southern Germany. Back in the 1960s, number U45-903, an 060 tank engine, was still operating and was typical of the motive power of these narrow gauge lines. Yugoslavia was still a united and stable country at the time of Harry Dodge's visit. Around the national and Serbian capital of Belgrade, modernization was making itself felt in the form of electrification, but there was plenty of steam still to be found. The Yugoslavian Railways, or JZ, inherited an incredible hodgepodge of standard and narrow gauge motive power from Austria, Hungary, the old Balkan province of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and the Kingdom of Serbia, as well as German and American locomotives. Here we follow our Class 05 Pacific as she pulls a passenger train through the suburbs and out into the Serbian countryside. Travelling west to the Croatian capital of Zagreb 
Harry discovered some of the city's colorful blue trams, while on the railways he found that diesel rail cars provided the majority of passenger traffic. But the days of steam were far from over, and much of JZ's mixed traffic was still efficiently hauled by Class 11 480s. 52 of these renowned ex-Hungarian Class 424s were acquired by the JZ before Stalin's feud with Tito cut off further supplies. Sarajevo was Harry's last Yugoslavian destination, but initially his attention was diverted from steam by the many trams. From the 1870s, the Austrian administration in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Dalmatia busied themselves by building narrow-gauge railways to connect the southern borders of the empire, and in doing so, gave the area a distinctly Austrian character. Many of Yugoslavia's busiest routes retained narrow-gauge tracks into the 1960s, and Sarajevo was the center of a considerable 760-millimeter gauge network which ran all the way down to the Adriatic. Typical of the motive power on this line were the Class 83 082s. With their tall domes and distinctive corbel chimneys, these powerful little engines regularly worked freight trains up the steep track between Titovo and Sarajevo. When narrow gauge was in its heyday, the sheds at Sarajevo Novo still housed plenty of steam. 062 tank engines proved to be useful little shunters, and class 85 Ricardos, with their white wheel rims, supplemented the class 83s as the standard heavy duty mixed traffic locomotive. The terrain here is uncompromising, and both the class 83 and the 85s were worked hard. Between Mostar and Sarajevo, the line was originally negotiated only with the help of several wreck sections.
yard, we catch a glimpse of another 062 tank, as well as a class 73 262, another representative of motive power common on Yugoslav's narrow gauge. Reasonably level track is a rare commodity around Sarajevo, and as a result, long trains were not only double-headed, but often had to be provided with a mid-train helper and a banking engine as well. On the turntable back at Sarajevo, Harry Dodge captured a final example of JZ narrow gauge steam, the class 97. With its typical Austrian looks, this pre-war locomotive was still more than capable of proving her worth and regularly pulling both freight and passenger trains high up into the mountains.
Next, Harry Dodge's search for steam took him to East Germany. The name of Deutsche Reichsbahn, dating from between the wars, was retained by East Germany after World War II, when Germany was partitioned. In terms of steam appeal, the new DR continued to prosper. Existing classes of locomotives often retained their old designations, but new designs and rebuilds meant that the DR engine soon acquired a unique appearance, one that was generally more pleasing than those of their more affluent rivals in the West. At the time of Harry's visit, the Decapod was still almost universal on heavy freight trains in both East and West Germany. The original class 50, 210 was built by Henschel between 1938 and 1944. It was the model for the successful wartime austerity class. More powerful and much lighter than the old G10 or class 44, it was therefore suitable for practically all lines. Some 10,650 engines of this basic design were finally built, making it the most numerous steam locomotive group in the world. German passenger engines were not left wanting either. The four-cylinder compound Pacific, designed by Maffei's Anton Hamel in the early 1900s, went through many stages of development. In its day, the great Maffei Pacific pulled every type of German passenger train, creating the classic image of German express rail travel. New designs in the 1950s and an extensive rebuilding program throughout the 1960s gave the DR an ultra-modern steam fleet. But even in East Germany, the advance of the diesels was relentless, and steam was eliminated from most of the DR only a short while after it disappeared from Western Germany. One place where steam is alive, even today, is in the Harz Mountains. And here, on the Selketalbahn, Harry Dodge found some very distinctive meter gauge locomotives. Much of the motive power on the Selketalbahn was still provided by these 0440T mallets, which were originally built for the neighboring Nordhausen Werning Rode Eisenbahn. But the mainstay of motive power on the Hartz network were the impressive 2102 tanks. The majority of these locomotives were built by the Karl Marx works for the Deutsche Reichsbahn between 1954 and 1956. But there were also a few older pre-war Schwarzkopf tanks still serving out their last years at the time of Harry's visit. Back on standard gauge, the yards of Halberstadt were host to more class 52 decapods. This variation of the 210 was adopted in 1942 and had already doubled his expected service life of 10 to 15 years. Entering the station at Halberstadt was an 01 Pacific. This classic two-cylinder locomotive was the most celebrated class of DR steam. Along with the 03 class, it is representative of much of the style and pride which Germany invested in her railways in the 1920s and 30s. And surviving examples are amongst the best loved of all German preserved steam. In the then divided city of Berlin, modern diesels and electrics handled most of the passenger traffic, but there was still plenty of work for steam.
280 tank engines came in handy for shunting, and the mighty class 5210Os were not easily replaced. But not all East German locomotives had prospered as well as the Deckerpots. By the mid-1960s, some classes of post-war locomotive were no longer common, and the Class 62 Baltic was a worthwhile find even then. To the southeast of Cottbus, near the border with Poland, Harry Dodge discovered more narrow gauge steam. Pulling out of the sheds on a bright and sunny morning were these three delightful little 060 tank engines. East Germany has several sections of isolated narrow gauge lines, and although modernized, most were steam worked until very recently. 010 tanks were the usual motive power on the DR narrow gauge, but examples of a wide range of smaller but equally interesting engines also existed. The scene at the station at Cottbus presents a contrast between the old and the new as a modern rail car pulls out in front of an older Pacific Hall passenger train. Further south, in the town of Gera, early morning mist cloaks the yards. Pulled by a 262 with a diesel bringing up the rear, a passenger train edges its way into the station and under the massive arch which covers the platform.
a large tank locomotive, possibly one of the pre-war 464s, which had already been replaced in the West, hauls another passenger train with diesel help, this time on its way out of Gera. station scenes but this time narrow gauge. Here the motive power is provided by Sachsenmeyer 040 plus 040 articulator tank engines. These unusual locomotives are beautiful survivors of a bygone age and until 1986 their most famous haunts were on the meter gauge section from Wolkenstein to Jornstadt where unsuitable roads kept the line economically viable. Number 99, 1606-5, stroke five, is very similar in appearance to a mallet, but unlike the mallet, the cylinders on this Saxon Meyer are back to back. In the nearby town of Zwickau, we come to the end of Harry Dodge's tour of Eastern Europe. Producing plenty of steam, this Class 41 Mikado was a recent rebuild of an older class of locomotive. Although East Germany stopped developing new classes in 1960, hundreds of older engines continued to be upgraded for the next 10 years, giving East Germany one of the finest steam fleets anywhere in the world. we cannot leave without taking a final look at the magnificent 01 Pacific. And Harry followed number 1514 stroke seven as she glided through the yards on the way to the engine shed. Harry's tour of Eastern Europe coincided with the end of an era. Even behind the Iron Curtain, the long reign of steam was slowly coming to an end. While the water columns still service steam locomotives, the new generation of modern diesels were poised to take over.
if you have enjoyed this program, then there's plenty more steam around the world in the four other programs which make up the rest of this series. We start with Africa, where rails all the way from Cape to Cairo was once the dream of Victorian pioneer Cecil Rhodes. In 1965 and 1970, Harry Dodge visited and recorded what is left of this incredible legacy. Throughout Central and Southern Africa, the uncompromising terrain spawned some spectacular feats of engineering. Many of these, including the famous Victoria Falls Bridge, are recorded when huge fleets of galleys were still ruling supreme. The East African Railway, Benguela Railway, Malawi Railway, Rhodesian Railways and Franco-Ethiopian Railways are all featured, as well as the steam trains of South Africa, Mozambique, Angola and the Sudan. In the next program, Harry Dodge has captured the incredible variety of Asian steam, commencing in India with Bengali broad and narrow gauge lines. We visit the exquisite Darjeeling Railway, which is considered by many to be the world's finest, while Jaipur's meter gauge system contrasts with other locomotives, ranging from huge Pacifics to tiny two-foot tanks. Wider afield, there is Japanese preserved steam, the wood-burning locos of Thailand, Indonesian tank engines, and Malaysian light steam. While in Australia and New Zealand, we find an equally delightful assortment of gauges and rolling stock. Latin America. This program, filmed between 1962 and 1971, features an amazing variety of Latin American steam, including garrets in the high Bolivian desert and narrow gauge through the Guatemalan jungle, with everything from 2102s to 040s. Linked by a dramatic journey over the Andes Mountains, Harry Dodge has captured the locomotives of a whole continent. Brazil's Leopoldina Railway, the rope hold Serra de Inclines, British locomotives in Argentina, the Antofagasta and Bolivia Railway, the incredible railways of southern and central Peru, one of the seven wonders of the railway world, as well as railway scenes from El Salvador and Mexico. In this program, Harry Dodge filming in the dying years of European steam, features an amazing variety of locomotives, including everything from garrets on the hot Spanish plain to Greek saddle tanks and narrow gauge along the German Rhine. Here is a final glimpse of the force which once powered a continent, including Italian steam in Venice and Pisa, French locomotives in locations which extend from a Parisian hump yard to the calm of Brittany and Provence as well as railway scenes from Luxembourg, Denmark, Belgium and Portugal. <laughs>